of the most popular spirit animals of all time is the great white winged horse Pegasus from Greek, Greek mythology. And if you have been seeing winged horses or have had Pegasus show up in dreams or wherever you see them, um, you might be wondering what the meaning is of this winged horse. And so today's video, we're going to look into the spiritual meaning of Pegasus. But the interesting thing about Pegasus is that you have to understand Pegasus in terms of the whole myth. We can take him as just himself, as just the, the, the winged horse, um, and I'll go into that, but you can't really take Pegasus out of the, its whole context um, with, you know, and, and be able to understand him. So in addition to looking at the spiritual meaning of Pegasus, we're also going to delve into the myth of Medusa, who actually, um, surprisingly enough, is Pegasus's mother. So um, hang on to your seats here. This is a pretty wild ride. <laughs> and let's just get started. Okay, so before we go into the actual story of the myth, let's look at just the, the, the aspect of a winged horse, okay, that idea. If you haven't yet, you might want to check out my horse spirit animal video. I will put the link in the description below. Um, but horse in a nutshell has a lot to do with forward momentum, with power, and with carrying over obstacles. Um, it's one of just a few animals that is really considered a companion of man. And it's one that has carried mankind all over the world. Um, it, the horses have been used for agriculture, for going into battle, and, and really like, you know, the phrase, a real workhorse, right? <laughs> that, that, has a, a, a deep meaning, right? Um, so horse and humankind is very, very inextricably linked. And in terms of moving mankind forward, and I think that's where we're looking at when you look at the, the, um, the symbology of Pegasus, it really is sort of an evolutionary thing because if you think of a horse as a landbound creature, but Pegasus has sprouted wings. So he's taking it up a level and going from the, the idea of kind of the earthly plane up into more of the spiritual realm. Okay, so horse, I always think of as an animal that has um, a lot to do with the elements of earth and fire. And then Pegasus adds that air element to it. So the air is the element of the mind, and it's also kind of the, the higher perspective. In this regards, Pegasus not only is a horse, but it really, I think it relates a lot to eagle um, and just the ability to, to take the, the, higher, um, the higher planes or the higher perspective. So if Pegasus has been coming forward for you, you might also look at my eagle video and that may, may trigger things for you as well. Okay, so that said, Let's look at the actual story of Pegasus. And to do that, we need to relate the story of Medusa. Medusa was one of three sisters who were known as the Gorgons. Okay, and the Gorgons were kind of monsters, right? They had um, snakes instead of hair. Now, Medusa originally was one of these three Gorgons but as she evolved in mythology, she began, became known as a, um, a very fair-faced or very beautiful young woman. And I believe she was actually a priestess or an initiate in the temple of Athena. Um, so here's another character, Athena. And all these characters are all connected because this story really relates um, a, a a pathway or teaches a pathway of human evolution or um, the evolution of consciousness, okay, within humanity or within a human being. So if you are familiar with the goddess Athena, Athena is the goddess of wisdom. And the, how she was born was she actually sprang out of her father Zeus's head. Now Zeus is the, the highest god in the Greek pantheon. 
And so he's like this very, very powerful figure. She springs out of his head, which is really interesting because it's, you know, she's this female figure um, representing wisdom, but she's really separate from the earth, right? And in the Greek pantheon, she becomes this very, very powerful figure uh, and goddess figure. She is this feminine figure, but she does not have a normal <laughs> kind of out of woman sort of birth, right? She is born out of the masculine consciousness. Now we need to understand this myth in terms of kind of its original context, which is several thousands of years old, right? And this is a time in, um, in, in the world when we humans were starting to move out of the goddess consciousness and into the sky god kind of consciousness. And you, you have to remember that at that time, that was an important step for the evolution of humanity, okay? Now we're starting to move back into a, a more integrated or um, you know, the goddess is coming back as a powerful influence um, and we're integrating it more but back then it was it was sort of cutting edge right to, to have this more sky god kind of masculine consciousness and so when the goddess wisdom right or sophia athena right comes out of the sky god's head that is really really significant it signifies a new way of a kind of relating to spirit Right, which remember that back then, <laughs> back then that was that was new. That was not you know the the old order. It was something that was beautiful, new that needed to happen for 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 humanity to move forward. Okay, so we've got this goddess Athena representing wisdom and coming from the head, okay, coming from mind. So this is definitely, she represents this feminine aspect of the masculine, of the mind, of the logic, okay? But since she's feminine, she also has that intuitive capacity. So she really represents this, this intellect and logic, but tempered with the intuition in order to come up with actual wisdom, okay? So she represents like the natural law in a way, right? Okay, so she has this temple and Medusa is there, right? I believe as an initiate um, and the Poseidon is the god of the sea and he comes up out of the sea and he's very attracted to Medusa and they end up having sex in the temple. And again, we need to recognize this myth and and just kind of see it for what it was in context and also what these symbols are for the subconscious mind okay because there's all sorts of modern interpretations of the medusa myth that portray medusa as being a victim or you know really pointing out the this, this whole patriarchy kind of thing that you can read into this as though, you know, that, that Medusa was either raped by Poseidon or even if it was consensual, she was punished. And, and of course, Poseidon wasn't, right? So I'm going to set that aside, but let's look at the symbolism and what each of these symbolizes, because that is still pertinent to the subconscious mind, because the subconscious mind is not politically correct, okay? We need to just make that really clear. And if we start putting our political correct spins on these things, we will miss a lot of the actual meaning of the myth. And so if you can just kind of put whatever emotional attachments that you may have to some of these things, and, you know, I, I had those attachments as well, but if we can set those aside for a bit and just look at the, the characters. Um, all right, so Poseidon and Medusa, who at this point is this beautiful maiden, right, um, have sex in Athena's temple, and this enrages Athena. She's like, this is this is completely inappropriate, and she comes down on Medusa, right? Of course, Poseidon being a god, he just goes his own way, but Medusa is the one that bears the brunt of of this, 
And what Athena does is she curses Medusa and she gives her horrible serpents in, in place of her beautiful hair because she was known for her gorgeous hair. Athena tends to really hit where it hurts, right? Um, so, so here's Medusa and she, from being this beautiful creature has now become the most hideous creature on the face of the earth. And even if she's still beautiful, what happens is that when any mortal person looks on her face, he turns to stone, okay? So it's just this hideousness that is imbued within her being. Um, okay, so then, the, so she's known as this monster. And then the next, we're just gonna go skip ahead to the, the, the end of the Medusa because the Medusa, Medusa's death is really where a lot of her power comes from, okay? So Medusa, um, gets exiled to this island. And at some point the hero Perseus comes along, right? And he has been given this task to behead Medusa and bring her head back to um, a, a king, I forget his name. And I won't even go into that story, but he, Perseus is actually a favored of the gods and he's given all these magical gifts to help him in, in this task. And Athena actually gives him a magic mirror, okay? And this is how he overcomes Medusa because he can't look directly at her, but he can hold up the mirror, look at her in the mirror, and this is what he did. He ended up beheading her with a sword, looking in the mirror, okay? And so then he brings the head back. And again, that's another story. Um, but here's where Pegasus comes in because when he beheads Medusa, out of the neck of Medusa springs to offspring, because she had become pregnant by Poseidon in that temple, right? In the temple of wisdom, she had become pregnant by Poseidon. And when she's beheaded, these two beautiful offsprings spring out of her neck. And the one is Pegasus, the winged horse. And then the other one is um, Chrysaor, who is a, a huge golden armored warrior with a golden sword. Okay, so let's look at this. Oh, and there's more to the story, but let's analyze this to this point <laughs> because um, every one of these characters illustrates an aspect of the self. Okay, and, and archetypal aspects. So this, these are patterns that we can see within ourselves in the, 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 the human spirit journey, right? And also in the collective. Okay, so what do they symbolize? Well, if you look at Medusa as she's actually um, comes out of the water, right? She's, she's related to some water deities. Okay, so both she and Poseidon have ties, big ties to the water, right? Poseidon is the god of the ocean and the sea. What does this tell us? Well, water is this element of the deep unconscious. This is what it represents, right? Going down into the depths, we go down into the, 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 the depths of our souls, right? Um, it also indicates the deep... Um, kind of primordial, it's where human beings or all life began on the earth, right, is in the oceans. So this is really, really primordial forces we're talking about. And Poseidon is like the, the masculine force um, and, and Medusa represents the feminine. It's like the animal nature, right? But it's also connection, it's the emotion, it's the emotional body, right? So both of these together, they represent a, a huge amount of spiritual power, but really around the emotional body, okay? And also they represent the animal nature, just the, the act of having sex and, you know, this, the, the, the watery thing. It's like, you know, it's all emotion and it's all feeling, it's all... <laughs> but it's not the higher level of logic, right? Of intellect, 
that Athena represents. This is why she is so enraged. It's not because they're having sex. If they'd had sex anywhere else, no problem. She would have been fine, but uh, they were defiling her temple. We have to recognize that Athena is a one of the few virgin goddesses. And what this represents to me anyway is, uh, you know, by being a virgin, she is very, very fixated on the truth. Okay. Virgin means that you are self-contained, right? That you're not mingling your energies with anybody else. So she's really about sovereignty and she's about recognizing boundaries, right? And so all of this is violated when, when they're actually fornicating in the temple. And so, you know, understanding that we know why she was so enraged, but we also have to recognize that Athena and Medusa have this, um, they're, they're like two polarities of the same thing, right? They're both very intuitive. They're both, you know, this feminine intuition. Well, Medusa's the, Medusa is the, uh, the primal aspect of that, right? And if we think of the lower chakras, okay, she's the lower chakra aspect of the, the intuitive feminine, whereas Athena is the very higher aspect of it, right? So Athena and Medusa are two poles of the same energy. This is why Athena comes down so hard on Medusa, right? Because she represents a less evolved uh, version of herself and she doesn't want to slide back. Um, okay, so when... Medusa is slain. Think of the terms of like Perseus coming in as the hero. He represents the seeker, right? The 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 um the spiritual initiate, the the person you know, you and me who is on this journey, right? He's he's and he's given this tool to be able to see what's really going on. Okay, this is the mirror of clarity, and mirrors usually are. Uh, illusion right um and but this mirror actually enables him to see what's going on um it is so hard to see what's going on in your own ego that we need a mirror right a lot of times in order to actually see the dark part of ourselves and be able to get through it right um medusa represents you know, in her negative form, not the beautiful form, but the, the really ugly form, this represents when the animal nature of the intuition, right, um, is out of place, or if it's, if we're just a person who's kind of reverted, and we all do this, right, this is part of the journey, but we have aspects of ourselves that are animal in nature, and part of the great work of the human soul is to learn to transcend the animal nature and to um, kind of bring it up into a higher spiritual level, right? And so Medusa is, <laughs> um, as she takes on this horrible Gorgon form, that represents that animal nature that is unbridled, that is unable to be directed by a higher spirit, right? This is just the, the pure animal nature and in a human being, right? If she had stayed a beast, it would have been fine. But when it appears in a human being and without that um, higher wisdom guiding it, then it becomes beastly, okay? And that's what it represents. And so when Perseus comes in and he slays the beast of Medusa, it liberates higher aspects of her, right? And so in this, we are seeing the, the trinity, the trifecta, which is the masculine, the feminine, and the holy child, right? In this case, it was a kind of a lower masculine and feminine that actually gives birth because the, the higher child, the, 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 the holy child in any trifecta is going to take things to the next level, right? It's the Christ essence. So Pegasus has this connection with the Christ essence. This, this is a representation of, of being slaying one's own inner, inner demons, right? 
and he does it with the aid of a mirror. Um, this is really significant because a lot of times our ego <laughs> can't look directly at our inner, we can't recognize it, right? Or if we do recognize it, we are so paralyzed by shame <laughs> that it, it, it can be paralyzing. And people actually, you know, um, really go into a, a deep depression sometimes when they realize their inner demons, right? When, they're, when they recognize it. So this is actually the function of a lot of myths and archetypes is that they reflect our dark aspects or our undeveloped aspects, the, the parts of us that the ego doesn't want to admit. These can be reflected in the archetypes. And we see it sometimes on the shadow side of spirit animals, any kind of shadow totem. They're able to reflect for us what's going on that our ego doesn't want us to see. Right. So that's what Perseus was able to do with this magic mirror. It mirrored for him and, and he was able to see what his ego would have gone into total paralysis. Right. And he was able to slay the demon, um, you know, slay the monster that way. And when he slays that monster, that's when he liberates these beautiful, um, you know, higher essences of that sacred union. It's still a sacred union. It's just one that is not at the level that it needs to be. And in the slaying of the monster, it, it brings it up to that level. Okay. So she gives birth to these two sons and um, in a, a, a trilogy, it's almost always masculine, feminine, and male child. And that just signifies, remember that the masculine is a kind of an outward expanding and it it has to do with being able to take action in the outer world versus in the inner world right so when when you liberate your christ essence and are able to transcend your demons and 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 step out as a sovereign human being who's in alignment with your spiritual higher self then you you know, that's the, the point at which you can step out into the world and um, actually bring your wisdom to bear in the world. Okay. So that's what that whole myth is. And, and Pegasus symbolizes this, this liberated, um, you know, consciousness, this higher consciousness. Um, but it's interesting that he's got this brother. Okay. We don't hear a lot about Christ or a lot. Um, but there's two aspects to it, okay? So even though they're both male in the myth, they kind of have to be because it's talking about being able to be active in the world. Um, I see Pegasus as actually the feminine aspect of that higher self. So I see Pegasus as, as the intuitive, right? He's actually the divine feminine higher self, right? That's able to really, he's still grounded on the earth he's in animal form remember that animals are connected with the earthly plane so that feminine essence symbolized by pegasus even though he's italian it's that animal intuition that's able to transcend the the base sensuality of medusa and head into the higher realms without losing that animal intuition that's so important okay and then his brother represents the masculine side, who is this uh, golden warrior with the sword. The sword represents the, the intellect and the ability, very much like the sword of Michael, right? The ability to discern and to cut away what doesn't belong to you, right? Um, it's a purification. So one big meaning of Pegasus is purification. If you're seeing the flying horse, coming up. It could be that you are in or about to enter into a cycle of purification, right? And this is related to the, the, the rising of the Christ consciousness or, or, or coming into your, a higher spiritual plane. Okay. Um, now the story of Pegasus doesn't end there because he he actually has a lot of adventures. And one of the things that Pegasus can do is he can strike his, his foot on the ground and 
where he does that, a stream will gush forward. So again, this is relating back to water. He is a creature of water as well as air. Okay. And remember with the horse being fire and, and earth, but Pegasus also bringing in the air and the water element, he's balanced, right? He's fully balanced. And there's the forearms of the medicine wheel, right? So again, this, this Christ consciousness, but a very feminine one, okay? And that he's got the animal nature and this fluid connection with water. Okay, so he'll, he'll have a bunch of adventures, but there is another hero, uh, yet another character here in, in Greek myth who is connected with, with Pegasus. And um, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing his name right. It's something like the Lephion. Um, and he is a master horseman, okay? And Belephian um, tames Pegasus. He's given a, a magic bridle because nobody can get near Pegasus, right? He's a very, very wild. And again, this represents the wild nature, right? And that wild, especially intuitive feminine nature that, that, that connects the higher self with earth, right? But nobody can get near him. It's wild. Well, he's given a magic bridle and he's able to tame Pe Pegasus and ride him. And Pegasus carries him all over and they do a lot of hero heroic deeds together. Um, and it would have been a happy ending, except that, the, I hope I'm saying this right, Belephian, he starts getting his ego gets out of check. Okay, so he represents this ego, right? Because even when we align with our higher, higher self, um, until we get to the level of like Jesus Christ or, or a real ascended master like that, we still have our, our lower ego. It just becomes more of a servant, right? So that's what the left hand represents is this lower ego that has come to this more enlightened state and is able to work with this, this um, higher intuitive faculty, right? But he loses that connection when he starts getting full of himself. He gets too proud. And Zeus looks down and he sees how proud this guy is becoming. He's starting to play God. He's starting to, you know, um, overreach his authority. And so Zeus sends a stinging fly to sting Pegasus. And Pegasus gets stung and he throws his rider off to his death. Okay, so this is just this myth is a warning that, and especially for anyone who is going through these, these higher initiations and starting to really connect with your Christ consciousness and your higher self, and things start to open up and you start to um, access higher powers within yourself. The, the myth acts as a warning to remain humble, right? That even though we are as human beings, you know, creator creatures, and we are that which, through which God creates, we, you know, but we are not God, right? We are not the totality of God. We're an aspect of God and we're given, we're given um, domain over our particular aspect, right? We're given the responsibility for our particular body, our particular, you know, uh, soul mission, right? But not beyond that. <laughs> so it's just a, just a little uh, kind of humbling sort of story to keep us where we need to be. <laughs> so Pegasus goes on to actually serve Zeus as a, like helping to pull a, a chariot of the sky. And eventually Zeus puts him into the sky as a constellation. So um, Pegasus, if you, Pegasus is coming forward, this can also mean a connection with your star family, you know, connection with the, um, you know, your, your, if you're feeling identifying as a star seed, this would be part of why Pegasus is coming forward for you. There's something in there with that star connection that may be, you know, ready to go deeper with that connection, um, you know, whatever that means to you. That's one of the aspects of Pegasus. So 
thanks for sticking with this. It's kind of a complex, <laughs> a complex constellation of archetypes, but I think it is really an instructive myth and an instructive archetypes that can help us to piece together the whole spiritual journey that we're all on. Um, all right, so if you have enjoyed this video, then I encourage you to like and subscribe. I do have a playlist of spirit animal videos that uh, I'll put the link to that in the description. And you can also sign up for my email newsletter. I send um, probably about one to four news, uh, emails per month, and this will be on all sorts of spiritual topics. All right, so have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. And remember you were born to be free.